Now, I don't know what it is about the Hyperloop, but boy, does some of these people want to believe. Now, let me start with a correction to my previous video where I actually made a mistake in the energy calculations that, as you'll see, totally changes the conclusions. So I accidentally put in the velocity in terms of kilometers per hour rather than meters per second. Now, of course, it's got to be in meters per second. Otherwise, it doesn't come out in the right units. So rather than putting in 300 meters per second, I actually put in 1,000 there. And of course, seeing as that's squared, that means that the final energy comes out off by about a factor of 10, an order of magnitude. So I guess all the Hyperloop groupies can dance a little jig that Thunderfoot made a mistake, and the Hyperloop is safe for another day. Yes, they're free to ride the monorail. Monorail! <gasps> I've sold monorails to Brockway, Ogdenville, and North Haverbrook, and by gum, it put them on the map. Sorry, the uh, Hyperloop, that's the solar-powered Hyperloop. It's also extremely energy efficient due to solar power utilization. Wait a minute, we can just shut off the power. No such luck, it's solar powered. Solar power, when will people learn? In fact, the Hyperloop could generate more power than it consumes to a brighter, safer, tomorrow. Eh, not quite. Now, there are times when an order of magnitude makes the world of difference. Like if I was claiming that I lost 50 kilograms on my diet rather than only losing five. And there are times when it really doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Look, in this case, you know the Hyperloop, the capsule is traveling at about the speed of sound. When I sat in one, Hyperloop starts to feel real. Will the seats be more reclined? Because uh, I go in 750 miles an hour, I feel like I kind of want to lean back. <laughs> Within a few centimeters of a wall that isn't, if anything goes wrong, you will be turned into a red mist or chunky salsa or whatever. Choose your metaphor. Doing 500 miles an hour. The system is proposed to travel at an average speed of 900 kilometers an hour and at a top speed of 1,220 kilometers an hour. The plane atomized with the impact. It just disappeared into dust. I mean, imagine rather than just being shot by a single bullet, which weighs, say, for instance, 10 grams. A handgun bullet travels at more than 700 miles an hour. 700 miles an hour. So at close range like this, the force is gonna take you off your feet for sure but it's really no more painful than a punch in the chest. You're gonna be fine, baby doll. How was that? Not so bad. Kind of fun, huh? Uh, which would sting and leave a mark. So now let's imagine it's not just being shot by a bullet, but your entire weight being shot against a wall. And yeah, the wall you're traveling in is within centimeters of the capsule. So it really doesn't matter whether you actually hit a wall head on or not. You're still going to get turned into chunky salsa. Yes, I admit that I was wrong about the energy of the capsule. It's not equal to two tons of TNT, but merely 200 kilograms of TNT, which is about twice my body weight. Either way, if anything goes wrong, you're out of luck. But couldn't you say the same for an airplane? Well, kinda, but planes don't typically fly within a few centimeters of something that isn't. You know, they don't fly supersonic within centimeters of the ground. I mean, this is one of the reasons why the planes fly all the way out there in the sky is because it's safer that way. At 30,000 feet, the air is nice and clear. There are remarkably few collision hazards at 30,000 feet. And even if something does go wrong, there's lots of air to fly the plane into. There are no immediate collision hazards. Further, there's no immediate hazard of, say, loose bolts or something being thrown up from the track at 30,000 feet. That's about 10,000 meters. And what's more, if the plane actually does crash, it doesn't destroy every other plane flying the same route. But the Hyperloop pressure isn't merely up in the air type pressures. It's basically it's space type pressures. Indeed, I was randomly reading up about Concorde today and found Concorde, which flew about twice the altitude of other planes. Now, the atmospheric pressure outside your typical plane at cruising altitude is about one fifth of an atmosphere, that sort of thing. 
However, with Concord, it was about 1 20th of an atmosphere, meaning that in the event of a depressurization, you would only get about 10 or 15 seconds of useful consciousness to try and put on your mask. And even at that, the atmospheric pressure is so low at that altitude that even on pure oxygen, you would be doing very well to stay conscious. Which is not that surprising as you normally breathe air at about a fifth of an atmosphere partial pressure of oxygen. Even breathing pure oxygen at one twentieth of an atmosphere, you're only getting one quarter of the oxygen that you would at sea level. However, the Hyperloop doesn't run at one twentieth of an atmosphere, but one thousandth of an atmosphere, <laughs> meaning that a depressurization event would be more like a rupture in a spacecraft or something. Well, you won't be standing there long. The minute we break out, well, you'll be a lot thinner once you get sucked out that hole. But the animal is inside out. I heard that. It turned inside out? And it exploded. Yeah, these aren't so much trains in these tubes, but spacecraft. And they're flying within a few centimeters of a wall traveling at the speed of sound. And of course, there were the comments about, yeah, but they laughed at the Wright brothers. They laughed at Galileo. Yes, and they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. Just because people are laughing at a stupid idea, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a great idea in the future. Or people were trying to justify it that this was just the prototype, just the first test. Uh, no, this was the first attempt at solar roadways, and this was their second. They still promise orders of magnitude more than what is possible. And yeah, sometimes orders of magnitude matter. Look, maybe the best way to explain this is the Hyperloop is promising you're going to have supersonic travel in vacuum tubes, and it's almost here. By the end of 2016, the end of this year, we'll have demonstrated Hyperloop operating with all of its components. We'll have showed the world this isn't a pipe dream, this is actually reality. Hyperloop One designers say this technology could be ready to go by 2020. That's like claiming, shortly after the invention of the rocket, that we'll all be travelling by rocket ship in five years time. Or like saying that after the invention of the jet engine, we're all going to have jet powered flying cars or, or personal jet packs, sorry, rocket packs, within five years. It's not because of a lack of vision that we don't have personal jetpacks. It's just the technical details as to why it's never been a practical and feasible form of transport. But that's basically what the Hyperloop is promising, personal jetpacks in five years time. Now, if you want to believe that, fine. And I've got a solar powered jetpack to sell you. Actually, now that I think about it, that is a really, really good idea for a Kickstarter.